This episode is brought to you by Jing's Mortgage Team. Jing's Mortgage Team is a team of real estate and mortgage professionals whose mission is to help anyone with their real estate needs. If you're looking to buy a home, sell a home, refinance your home, have credit issues, or in need of an investment loan, we can definitely help you. If you're looking for a real estate agent, we know the best of the best real estate agents. Visit the link below for more information. Tasha Nosworthy. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for coming on with Secret Sauce uh, with Hamilton awesome. Lau. Thanks for um, having me. Yes, it is my honor. For those that are just tuning in, Secret Sauce with Hamilton Lau is a podcast that strives to peel back the curtain on industry professionals, industry leaders, people that are top of their game. And today, we have the honor of having Sasha Nasworthy on, a one of the top realtors in the area, and she is going to grace us with you know amazing anecdotes of how she got into the industry, um, what she's about, and hey all the inspiration that we can get, you know, to, uh, to our viewers that are just tuning in to try to look for inspiration and motivation, you know. Um, again, thank you so much, Sasha. Thank you. <laughs> we are here today at uh, New Canaan. New Canaan. Canaan. <laughs> yes. New Canaan, <laughs> Connecticut. And I love the energy here because it really encapsulates, you know, what we're about, what Sasha is about, you know. So uh, again, thank you so much for coming on. And I love to dive into, you know, uh, a little bit about you. I love, love, love having guests on where, you know, their parents were immigrants, right? As yes. is yours. Yes, they um, are. <laughs> I love if you can, you know, talk a little bit about your, uh, your past, you know, uh, you know, when did your parents come mm -hmm. and, and your childhood? My parents are immigrants. Uh, my parents um, immigrated from, migrated from uh, Jamaica in the 70s. Wow. My mom came first. She worked very hard and uh, sent over for my father and their first three children. So my parents have been married now uh, 59 years. It'll be 60 years um, this December. And so they have seven children. I'm number six of seven. Wow. Um, <laughs> and that in and of itself is, I think, why I'm very innovative. I, I think being a child of immigrants, I was raised a little differently than my peers. Um, and while other friends of mine and colleagues that I went to school with and, and worked with over time, you know, they might know of Jamaica or visited Jamaica or even have family members in Jamaica. It is very different to grow up with two parents from that country that lived there their entire lives. Like they had an entire, they got married, they had three kids there, they had houses, they had careers. Wow. So it's different than when someone is like, oh yeah, my parents are Jamaican as well. And maybe they were born there and came over as children themselves. So you do have a different outlook. Mm. Um, I used, I'm, I'm regarded as what's called a Yankee because <laughs> I'm American. And I put that in, I don't know why I even do that because I do pride myself on also being Jamaican. Um, it's, it's just one of those things that it's all the food in my house, all, you know, the way we were raised, it, we went every year. It's just, it's such a part of who I am. Mm. Um, and my family is such a part of who I am, but also being number six of seven kids, um, you need to make your voice heard <laughs> or you will be overlooked. So of course. that lends itself to who I am as well. Yeah. You know, I have this theory about people who grew up in with many siblings. Mm -hmm. um, could you just share a little bit about the age difference between you and your siblings? Oh, yes. They'll murder me. <laughs> Hamilton. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, roughly, roughly. Well, we call them the first set. Sure. There's a middle child, yeah, and then there's the second set, right. and I'm part of the second set. Oh, wow. Okay. okay. So when I was born, my brother drove my mom to the hospital when I was being born. Wow. So. Okay. Okay. <laughs> a good idea. A, a general <laughs> understanding of the, the age gap. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, the reason why I ask this is that, you know, I, I find that, you know, people who have a, a large number of siblings, you know, there's an interesting perspective of community, like what community means at a young age, just because... You know, you have you know siblings, brother or sister, mm -hmm. who have their own friends yeah. and their own experiences within the the same community or neighborhood that you're in, 
And when they bring their friends over, it's like, wow, you know, you kind of see, you know, different experiences and different interactions. Well, actually, I guess maybe that was something unique with our house. Mm. Um, I think because there were so many of us and my dad being an immigrant, he was more mistrustful of humans. Oh, really? Of, you know, it, it, it's a, I need to protect. I need to protect ah. my family, my girls. I need to protect my wife. I need to protect my property. So therefore, um, we didn't really have many outsiders in our home. Oh, okay. It was more like there's enough of you to have friends with each other. <laughs> <laughs> you have a built-in best friend, a yeah. built-in nemesis. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, but because uh, my uh, the first set of kids were at a different stage of their life, um, they were working, going to high oh, school, college. By the time I was, I see. I was present-minded. Um, and so therefore I have a very respectful relationship with like my older brothers and my older sisters, right. but it's almost like I had a lot of people in charge of me mm. in a way, you oh, know? Okay. So basically any of them were allowed to discipline me. They were like, you know, it was, uh, there were a lot of eyes, you know, <laughs> they were grown. <laughs> exactly. Right. They're grown and you're not supposed to do that, you know? Right. So, and heavy on the respect in our family. So, um, it's almost like I grew up in a, the second set in a little bubble yeah. and my elder siblings like to say that we got a different version of mom and dad oh. because obviously over uh, that span of years and 20 years difference from sure. my eldest brother to myself. Okay. So basically I'm sorry, I kept trying to talk around it, but no, no, <laughs> no, no it's it. fine. It's fine. So because of that uh, 20 year age gap, just from the first child to the sixth child, mm -hmm. um, that obviously is two decades, an entire life, you know, um, I watched my mom become a grandmother wow. in, when my younger sister was a child as well. So wow. I was an aunt by the time I was like one years old, you wow. know. So I actually grew up really close That's with my nieces and nephews. Yeah. And and I'm sure other people regarded them as like my cousins, but they were actually my niece and nephew. Sure. No one actually called me auntie until I was probably like 12, the next set of kids that were being born. <laughs> right. um, but yeah, just heavy on the family. There was so much you, babysitting of our nieces. And, because by the time I was 12 years old, I probably had about five or six nieces and nephews by that time wow. and more on the way and helping my sisters plan their weddings when I was 10 and 12 years old, you know? So it is... Um, a different experience than just like their friends coming over because like I said, they were like getting solid right. in an adult life. In a different place. Right, exactly. Yeah. Wow, but it's also really cool because you're able to see, you know, again, you have this exposure and this experience of people in different places in Definitely. your life. Yeah. And I'm sure as a young individual to grow up with those kind of role models, that accessible role model, yes. you know, it's, it, I'm sure it has an impact, you know, because I'm sure, you know, again, people like, you know, other people who don't have uh, siblings with a bigger age gap, mm -hmm. um, they kind of just, it, it's almost unknown. There's like a big mystery and then it's like my parents, you know, right. but for you, you have like, you, you got exposed to this interesting, you know. Oh, I feel like it was the best thing in the world because yeah. um, I have a love of all the different mm -hmm. decades. Yep. Like. I almost think sometimes I was born in the wrong era because <laughs> I love the fashion from like the '60s, right. and I have an appreciation for the '70s and the '80s. The music, uh, yeah, the mu oh, the music for sure. Um, that's where my husband and I connect a lot on on music, yeah. just knowing all the different genres and the different decades uh, and versions and varieties of music, and and um, just being able to grow up with an eight-track player in the house at the same time that there's a CD player in the right. house, like right. that same that was my same childhood, like. So I think that allows me to speak to people from different gener generations, yes. different backgrounds, different ethnicities, a lot easier than other people because yeah. I'm not so close-minded on this is, this is the way things are and this is the norm. This yeah. is the norm for now. This right. is the norm that you know, but it's not the only normal, you know? Yeah, and I could totally see a huge advantage where, you know, a lot of people with immigrants as parents, if they have a question you know, pertaining to the future, it might be a little more difficult because, you know, a lot of times uh, immigrants don't really know the culture, the society mm -hmm. too well, but then you had a great advantage that you had, hey, older brother or sister who, mm -hmm. you know, at a different place yes. in your life and can kind of guide you yeah. with sage advice. Yeah, definitely. So that's, that's great. I wanted to ask you about, you know, uh, what you wanted to do at the time. Uh, I think when you I was said, a child? Yeah, when you were a child. I think you said you wanted to do uh, become an after, attorney, right? After I wanted to be a ballerina, then I decided <laughs> I wanted to be an attorney from I was nine years old. Wow. Yeah. Where did that...
inspiration come from? Well, actually, my dad. Okay. Um, my father, um, the very, very wise man. And I know a lot of people say that about their own dads, but like, uh, pretty much everyone who meets my dad agrees. He's extremely wise. Um, no one is perfect, but he does have a, a consciousness and a delivery that is easily digestible, very thoughtful and thought provoking. So he had asked me one day, what do you want to be when you grow up? And at the time I genuinely wanted to be a ballerina. <laughs> and I thought to myself, he's not going to like that answer. Mm -hmm. And number six of seven, I want to please my parents. Right. I'm, I have like kind of a middle child syndrome where it's you're going to get attention. It's either going to be good attention or bad attention. I really wanted good attention. Right. So I tried to do really well in school, always be respectful, have a smile on my face, be helpful. And so when he was a asking the question, I knew, well, I, or I thought I knew because I'm a child, that he would not be impressed with my response. He would not, he would not maybe like it. Right. And so therefore my kind of people pleasing part of myself came out and I was like, well, I do like to argue and I do like to read. <laughs> so I, in that moment said, I would like to be a lawyer. Right. And he was so proud. I mean, he yeah. was, I was like, ding, ding, ding. I said the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> um, and he would always talk very fondly of his own father yeah. who was like an, not an attorney, but represented people <laughs> in Jamaica in, in, in the court system and knew all the judges. And, and so he would talk so highly of his dad in that specific regard that I knew that that would be the right answer. It wasn't totally lent of what he would want. I thought to my own, uh, basically my attributes that were positive, my own traits that I feel like could serve me. And just as, as life went on and I got older, I just kept reinforcing that this was a good of course. route for me to go. Like I, I do want to be successful. I want to live in the city. I don't live in the city. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, like I said, I think I, I can hold my own in an argument. Heck for yeah. Sure. <laughs> and, and I've seen you in action, um, super tactful, super diplomatic, but still firm and know how to get things done. You know, I think you know, it really speaks volumes on you as a person. Oh, thank so, you. Yeah, yeah. It's um, so I, so I want to talk about you know going to Fordham, you know, mm -hmm. to pursue this amazing journey that yeah. you decided and you committed on doing. Um, and 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 I want to say like I'm sure our viewers can relate. You know, uh, you know that it's very important to kind of find that calling, and if it's linked to uh, say you know parents or family, you yeah. know, it's always like a great way to dive into a yeah. potential profession. But yeah, tell us a little bit about Fordham and uh, any experiences that's cool. I mean, um, I went to Fordham University and it's one of those things that I, I said it was going to be mine and it was mine. Right. As a first generation American. Commitment. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It, it's, it was certain things were just non-negotiables, you right, know? Right. And so when you, that's your norm, once again, speaking of norms, that was my norm is I'm going to go to college no one was guiding me on how I was going to go to college, how I was going to pay for college, how any of this was going to work out. Just, I'm going to go. And because my parents were not of this country, they didn't know which way to guide me or how to guide me, but they were like, yeah, you're going to go. <laughs> and my siblings had all taken their personal roots at this time. And I honestly didn't think to ask anyone because as an immigrant child, once again, I think you have this self-starterness about yourself. Yes. Like you just... You're not looking for help. You're looking for how am I going to get this done? Just like every paper I've ever done, every project I've ever done. I never came to my parents to do it for me or with me. I just knew I needed to get an A. <laughs> I, I wonder if that self-starterness, is this something that you saw from your parents and they kind of just instilled yeah. in? Yeah, yeah I, definitely. I can totally relate as well. Like my parents are immigrants as well. Yeah. And it's like just watching them self-start. Yeah. Like just... Like, oh my God, it's so inspiring. It kind of plants a little seed There's nothing my, my mom and dad cannot do. As a kid, and even as an adult, it's not even like something that, uh, oh, you know, it wasn't as much as I thought. No, I mean, my dad, he made my mom a car. He built her a car from scratch. Wow. Wow. He would fix any and everything. And I mean, he would restore it. So it would not look like a hodgepodge of like 
nails and glue and paint. Like it's beautiful when yeah. he's done with it. Yeah. So I'm not good with my hands, but I'm good up here. And so right. I'm really, I'm a strong reader. Um, I'm, a, I'm great with people, <laughs> so. Yeah, I can totally relate because my dad was a handyman mm -hmm. and he had like all these tools and wood and all this stuff in the house. And to me, it's like, I would talk to him and he's like, you can make anything. Yeah. And I, I could totally imagine it, trans and again, I could totally relate with you on this. I, I can imagine it translating to, hey, I could physically make anything, but at the same time, you know, mentally, I could I also can, mentally exactly. make anything yeah. like of myself or yeah. of things, you know? It, so, so it's a great foundation. Yeah. Wow, it's, it's I incredible. think even growing up with like, one TV essentially in the house. We had a huge house, a seven bedroom, five and a half bathroom house, gorgeous front stairs, back stairs, grand piano, one TV because of the immigrant upbringing. It's not everyone had a TV in their room. My friends did, but I did not. Mm. We watched what everybody else was watching. Yeah. And so if I didn't want to watch a scary movie with my brothers or Rambo for the 45th time with mm. my older brothers, I would go read a book. Right. And that's constantly what I would do. I would right. escape in my book to another world. And by the time I think I was 10, I'd read f Roots like four times just yes. because it was very entertaining yes. and it was a big book. And I was yes. like, at least I won't run out of something to read. Yes. Um, but yes, to your question about Fordham, when I went to Fordham, I actually chose Fordham University because it ha was associated with the Alvin Ailey Dance School. Is that the law school? No, oh, it's no. the dance school. Oh, the dance school. <laughs> oh, 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 yes. So, it, I, it felt kismet, like, oh my gosh, they have this pre-law program, they have Fordham Law that they're associated with, and it's Alvin Ailey. And I kind of, in the back of my head, thought, at least I can dance, do, do my passion while fulfilling a purpose. I never got to take a dance class while I was there because I graduated on time. <laughs> I, did, I did the course study in requ required to get my political science degree and my dual um, minor in English and African American studies. So there was no time for the dance class that I really, really wanted. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but that's what motivated me to sure. pick that school and the grounds, like, like where we are today. It's, I walked on that campus for a... Um, for a college visit in my senior year of high school, which wow. everyone knows is late. As an American, you know that's late mm. to be looking at colleges, but that's when I looked. Mm. And because like I said, no preparatory um, and advanced knowledge of what to do and where to go. But I decided I wanna be here. This is what, where I belong. And I applied to seven schools. I actually applied late to Fordham mm. and it was meant to be. Yeah. I, I got into the other schools, but that was my top pick and yeah. And I didn't even know when I got the acceptance letter how I was going to pay for it. I worked three jobs through college. Right. I, no one told me that's what I was going to need to do. I yeah. applied for every grant, right. for every scholarship that I possibly could. Mm. I constantly had to keep up with papers and filling out FAFSAs and all of this stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was a commuter student. Um, I took the train in. It's like an hour and a half, you said? No, no, no. Uh, to Fordham from New Rochelle, it was like 15, 20 oh, minutes. Oh, oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that was super that's short great. to take the Metro Fordham, North I think, in. on uh, 59th Street, right? No, and that's the, the Lincoln Center. Oh, okay. Uh, oh, so this was building. a Rose Hill in the Bronx oh, location. Oh, okay, got it. Yeah, got it, got it. It's, it, the grounds are gorgeous, and it's really close to the Bronx Zoo, the Botanical Garden. Oh, I see. Um, but yeah, um, going, going to Fordham, thinking I'm going to be uh, going to law school afterwards, taking the LSATs. Um, while I was working as a paralegal at the Kings County District Attorney's Office. Wow, we, we're not talking about that because <laughs> because it's Kings County being Brooklyn, right? Brooklyn, yeah. New York. Brooklyn is a crazy place. <laughs> <laughs> it is a wild, crazy place. And, you know, the District Attorney's Office for uh, people that aren't legal savvy, right? Uh, district Attorney is a person that's kind of in charge of a lot of different things in Brooklyn, legally, right? Yeah. Um, so, for example, they'll, they'll have like a I mean, I guess it's at the whim of the district attorney, whether they want to start a unit that focuses on domestic violence right. or drug yeah. crimes yeah. or um, police uh, abuse or et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And you had this incredibly eye-opening opportunity to work in this crazy, I'm sure like a really crazy environment with the, uh, at the time, district attorney. What was the name of the district attorney at the time? Um, Charles Hines. Charles Hines, right. Yes, but right. I worked for his senior deputy, okay. uh, Joan Gabadon, when I interned while I was still at Fordham um, for undergrad. And just working my way as her intern, surviving <laughs> as her intern. She was amazing, super smart, an amazing uh, 
just person to know and, and to be guided by. Yeah. Um, she called me a few days after graduation. She was at my wedding, by the way. Which oh. was, <laughs> that's wow. how dear, near and dear she was to me um, and is to me because it's in my memory. But this is a person who had a, a grand hand in who I was at that time in my early 20s. Right. And um, she could called you, me. Could you speak a little bit to that? Like, you know, what was about her, your interaction with her that helped form who you were? At that because that's a big impact right? yeah i mean she was a jamaican woman and i keep saying was i i apologize because no, no, i'm no, thinking yeah. in the past yeah, yeah, yeah. i, I no, don't no, mean no. to right, make right, her right, the right. past no, no. um but yeah she, jamaican um woman in a, in a field of men essentially um mm. she worked her way up for years i mean she took down huge 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 like uh, mobsters like she had crazy like records of just um, like amazing feats that she accomplished that no one else could have done. And, and she actually was in danger at times, like had police escorts and, sure. and um, yeah, no, she worked her way up. She was a mom. She, you know, uh, being a lawyer, being successful, that is a, a check mark in and of itself. Yeah. But she literally is in the history books and, yeah. and work, being her intern uh, exposed me to the reality of what a career in law would look like right. and um she just handled it with grace right. and with an iron fist <laughs> like she wow. definitely was a force to be reckoned with and she never looked scared even if she was i mean she commanded a room and i think that's what i i took from her is when you walk in a room you you own it mm -hmm. yeah what an incredible role model yeah you know it's like uh, especially for, again, somebody with immigrant parents, yeah. you know, like a lot of times I would say, like I would talk to parent, uh, people that have, you know, that are third, fourth generation, you know, living in America. And it's kind of like, you know, I, they, I always had parents that knew everything and kind of guided me through things mm -hmm. like how to handshake somebody, how to right. speak with people. Right. But then it's like, again, when you have a uh, immigrant parents, it's like a different kind of a experience, you yeah. know? So, so for me, like I had a similar experience as well when you, when you grow up and you kind of gravitate towards somebody that, aligns mentally with what you like and what you want to be like yes it's like it really serves an incredible impact to your life so yeah. i'm so happy that yeah you got to not just find this role model but have this role model shape you know who yeah. you are it's it sounds like she was a she is a powerful person yeah. <laughs> that, that did yeah. it too i'm sorry like she's a powerful person that is so you were so fortunate enough to have that experience i feel her. like no one in this world gets where they're any, to any level of success alone. Mm -hmm. Whether someone had a direct hand in it by by literally placing you in front of someone or speaking your name in a room that you weren't in positively or by just leading an, by example. Like you cannot pretend like you just came up from nothing and you just knew it. I, I think people who say things like that, like they're totally self-made. No, you're not. You are a person who decided to take the opportunities that you were presented with yep. and make the best of it. Yep. But no one gets anywhere alone. Yeah. Of success. Anyone. Yeah. A hundred percent. I can name like 20 other people that I would attribute to, to getting me to where I am presently. And I'm sure there'll be another hundred in, in, as my years go on in yep. my life, as, as my su success gets to new tiers. It's powerful because I'm sure, you know, um, I'm sure, what was her name again? Joan Gabadon. Joan Gabadon. I'm sure, you know, again, she just didn't wake up one day and become that incredible. I'm sure, I'm definitely not. you know, she received incredible light from somebody yeah. and they received so on and so forth. Yeah. And it's just how powerful of an impact it is to the community because you now have received this light and you're, uh, you know, maybe indirectly unbeknownst to you, continue to spread that light as well. You know? She had a special needs daughter, yeah. actually, and um, we're talking about 20-something years ago. Yeah. So, like, the world, not that it's easier, but some things with technological advances or even social media and oh, people yeah. having more awareness, um, community, uh, groups, accessibility to those groups, you know. Um, it's not just that something exists, it's that the people who need it know it exists. Yes. And I don't know if she had any support system for a child with uh, Down syndrome. Oh, get out of here. During her time, you know, right. nowadays we're so spoiled. That's what we Google, we Google stuff and you get answers. I mean, you can't ex you know, expect every answer to be correct. Right. <laughs> However, 
I can probably bet money that it's likely right. correct. No, it's, Back it's, in the it's day, much easier to 100%. gain information. But even still, you can't, we can't discount the hardships that people have to this day. Right. Because right. there's true. an inundation of information, it's mm. almost hard to decipher with what is, is correct and what's not correct, what's for you. Just because something has an A-plus rating or a right. five-star rating or it's the first result when you search it yeah. doesn't mean that's really the right, right. thing. It right. just means that they either paid for the advertisement. Right. That is true. Or, you know. The so, SEO stuff, right? Yeah. But however, I do want to make a, an important point that you know during uh, you know her time, there there was no Google, right? You know? It's like there wasn't the only Google. people that you can really ask is what your family and friends. Yeah. you know that's kind of like and it's you know, even the knowledge to even yeah. know. And and once again, I don't want to speak for her. Maybe she had an amazing yeah. support sure. system. Maybe she had access. But me watching her as yeah. a young woman, um, I was engaged when I was uh, working for her, and I remember. One of the advices she actually gave me was, don't get married. <laughs> and I was like, uh, oh, and that's what I was saying about discernment. Yeah. Like, even though you can look up to someone and you can admire them for what their positive traits are, you don't have to take everything they say as gold. Yeah. You still have to use your own brain yeah. and apply it to your life of what do you want yeah. and, and what speaks to you. Oh, I love that. And I mean, technically, if she was right, I got married and had a son, and he, that changed the trajectory of my life. I did not go into law as previously planned, um, but it was the best thing for me. Yeah, yeah, and it's a. Uh, I love that. There's a lot to unpack there because it's like you have a, you know, healthy sense of skepticism. You know, there's people that don't. It's like, <laughs> hey, you know, I'm just gonna, you know, and and, you know, to them, I yeah, I would say, you know, a lot of soul searching, you know, but like. Mm -hmm to have that healthy skepticism and just bring that with you now, yeah. it's kind of, it's how people evolve. It's how people grow, right? To have yeah. that healthy skepticism, you know? I think um, you got to listen to your gut. Mm -hmm. Your gut is 99% of the time, that's what's right. Ah. Whether you're afraid, yeah. whether you're excited, you, you know, you could be with a group of friends and you're super excited about a movie coming out and everybody's like kind of downplaying the movie. Does that mean you shouldn't go see the movie? Mm -hmm. I mean, are you a leader or are you a follower? Mm. And mm. maybe you see a movie and it changes your life or it feeds your soul. That's what art is supposed to do. It's supposed to feed you in some way. Yeah. Obviously, not everything is as beautiful artistic. Some things are horror, some things are comedy, but it is supposed to keep feeding you, just like how food feeds you life, everything. That's why we're here even today. It was it was to like fully be involved with what makes us human, right. you know? Inside, outside, technology, but nature and community and humanity and mm -hmm. of course, of yeah, course, all of it. But I want to come back to you know your experiences, you know, at the VA. You know, like you know, was there you know besides being connected with such an incredible person and role model, you know, how else was your experience like during that time? I mean, you were there for many, many years at that time, even after yeah. you graduated, right? Like, well, yeah, I, I, she called me after I graduated to congratulate me on the graduation and tell me that, very dry, that I have an interview. <laughs> 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 and I was thinking in my head, I would love to enjoy my summer, <laughs> but I, I went to the interview and I did get the job wow. and I was hired as the um, public foil Paralegal. So I handled all public requests for the entire Kings County. And what does FOIL represent again? What does it stand for? Freedom of Information Law. Law. Right? Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. okay, cool. So you were in charge of, at least in the DA's office, if so I, I would. A request from a school, a public organization, the FBI, and, the police. Right. Yes, exactly. You would process. Even like other police departments, they would, you know, inquire because a case could be ongoing in California sure. about someone who got arrested in Brooklyn. Um, my job was specifically to find the file, and a file could be literally a file folder, or meaning an, a rap sheet, like an arrest. A lot of things were not digitized. Um, yeah. They were, they were starting to transfer over to um, digital copies, but the way it was done at that time is I would have to go and sign the case file out of the archive. And that could be 27 boxes. Right. And I would have to comb through each and every line of those files and redact out manually um, the witnesses um, identifying features, names, addresses, uh, same thing with the victims, most importantly, obviously. So in my hands was this great weight 
at 22 and 23 years yeah. old of making sure that some person who wronged these people caused them great harm because it was a lot of murder cases and abuse cases. I couldn't let any information out. And so it was important that I read every single line. That's very, very important. I mean, again, to our viewers now, you know, younger viewers, you know, if you have requests for information and you kind of get it, and if it's digitalized, it's just a few buttons of click mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then you print it out and you yeah. get it in a few weeks, you know. <laughs> At that time, they, they didn't have that. You had to physically I would blow go. the dust off of the Holy boxes moly. sometimes. You, yeah, I, I just, I can't imagine like, you know, 50 years ago when, you know, they didn't have foil. Yeah. I'm sure, I was going to say, I, I, yeah. every, every time has its own version of hardship. That's why I would, I, in my love of the different decades, I would feel silly feeling like I grew up through any hardship because right. there were dishwashers. I wasn't allowed to use it because right. of an immigrant family. Sure. <laughs> it was a dish drainer. Yeah, 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 <laughs> That's yeah. where you wash the dishes and dry them. <laughs> yeah. We cannot trust this dishwasher to yeah. <laughs> properly wash the dishes. How dare I? Um, we had a washer and dryer, but we still hang the, hung the sure. clothes. So it's like, like I said, I lived in the uh, house where it had technology, but we had the old way in a way as well, but I wasn't hand washing my clothes. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? So, you know, there's nothing to complain about. It's just your reality. Yeah. 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 So during that time, you know, I'm sure you had an incredible experience uh, with the DA's office, but you know, what was the next life event that happened? So I got married while I was at the DA's oh. office and we had a honeymoon baby and oh. yes, um, I, I came back from a trip. Uh, when we first got ma married, it was like a month and a half in and I woke up and I turned to my husband and I said, I'm either dying or I'm pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> And he was like, those are different things. <laughs> and I was like, no, nope, they feel the same. Yeah. My new parents, I'm sure you can, you know, you can relate. <laughs> and he was like, why would you say that? So, yes, um, obviously I was pregnant. Um, had my son, who's now 16 years old, light of my life, love him to bits and pieces. He made me a mom. Uh, we named him Nathaniel, gift of God. And I was on maternity leave when I had him and looked at him and realized I'm not going back. <laughs> I'm not going back to Brooklyn. I'm not doing a three hour a day commute going and coming, hour and a half going, hour and a half coming back, three hours a day on top of the work day that I'm going to be away from him. It just felt not fair to either of us. So I made the decision to actually work closer to home a, a few months after he was born um, as a legal secretary for a tech company and that did not go well because I was still suffering from some postpartum. Sure, so sure. Uh, I would go find myself on a bathroom break to cry in the bathroom oh, wow. while um, my colleagues were on smoke breaks. Oh, right, <laughs> so, right, right. so yeah, only a few months later, it was for the best that I, I was home with him. Yeah. And um, we were blessed yet again with our daughter and then whoop, another one. So another daughter, three beautiful blessings, yeah. um, but my kids were three under three. Wow, wow. Yeah. Wow. So pull-ups, diapers, and diapers. <laughs> <laughs> wow, talk a little bit about what does, being, uh, what does being a mom mean to you? I'm sure, it's, again, for me as a, as a father, I, it, it, it completely changed my personality. Yeah. You know, so I have 100%. like, you know, obviously my, my own perspective on what does it mean to be a father, but I'd love to, to you know, Get your thoughts on what does it mean to you? Like, how did it impact best your thing, life? Best thing I've ever did. Talk about pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. Uh, that was, I never even thought of being a mom, ever. Like, mm -hmm. I maybe when I was, like, pretending to be a bride when I was, like, seven or something like that. But I really did not plan on having children. I didn't try not to either. It just, I was so young. I just graduated college. I'm deeply in love as I still am, <laughs> um, and not making that plan, but just rolling with it is kind of my life. Um, but knowing that this is so much more important than anything I've ever done, um, they're, they're amazing. They make me a better person. Um, they've made me a better person. Yeah. And if I do nothing else in this world of any worth or value, I've been their mother. Oh, I 100% relate to every single thing that you say and i'm sure our parents out there that are listening can relate as well it's like you know i i've known friends that are older that mm -hmm. don't have any kids and there is a sense of 
when we talk about the topic of kids, there is a sense of emptiness. It seems like, you know, it's like, oh, you know, a sense of maybe I should have had kids when I was younger, you know? But I feel like, you know, to that, I feel like some, I know quite a few people who've made the decision not to have kids or could not have children yeah. with their partner for oh, whatever yeah, reason course, and opted not to proceed you know, in being parents like or foster parents. Yes. Or, right. or even got married and became an early widow. And right. that's, you know, there's so many reasons. So I would never, I, I genuinely don't think that they're missing something. Yeah. Right, right. I, okay. uh, yeah. I feel like you make a life, you yeah, know, that's and, true. and a lot of my suffering <laughs> in, as an individual, is because I made sacrifices to be a mother. Right. There are sacrifices I would never turn back the hands of time for. I would never change. I would never alter. Yeah. But they are still sacrifices. True. And yeah. so for other people who have not had to make those type of sacrifices. Or want to make those or, sacrifices. Exactly. Right? Then technically it's one of those uh, six or half a dozen. It's it's just a different perspective right. of the same amount, right? Yeah. Are you happy with your life? Are you adding value? Some people who are not parents add great value to children in the, in the by being a teacher or by being a, an instructor or, or a coach mm -hmm. or, you know, they are actually molding and helping the next generation right. in their way, just not with their DNA. Right. You know, right. mine was not on purpose, but they are by far the funniest, kindest, most amazing human beings and i know i'm a little partial but they are they make it easy to be their mom is my yeah. point like yeah. all of the other stuff like i'm sure i would have went through other hardships if i wasn't a mom yeah. like i would have other issues i would have other downfalls and disappointments yeah but they made me rally when th there were there was no rallying mm. <laughs> you wouldn't you would not think there's a way out of this darkness just their presence made me come out wow it's like you know, many many parents again they they feel the same way you know? yeah um and and to each their own you're absolutely right yeah. about that you know yeah. it's uh yeah you know again you know the at least the people that i've speaking i've spoken to you know because they didn't necessarily make that sacrifice they sacrificed something else yes definitely. and they're at another place in their life you know so it's and they're also nurture they can still be a nurturer and 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 a figure of like i said change and, and help yeah. Because just because someone's a parent does not mean that they are parenting. There's a lot of... That's true. Yeah, that there, true. there's that's a true. lot of people reproducing and they're not actually making those same sacrifices that I, I think we, are, we attest our yeah. parents made and we make for yeah. our kids. Right. There are people actually just... And, that's, and that's, those were a lot of the cases I actually were, was reading in, in Brooklyn right. of these parents that should have never had children right. um, because of how horribly uh, they abused them and, oh, and treated yeah, them. Yeah. So therefore, yeah, yeah, it's not a universal, oh, yeah, you, you hit a switch. I think it speaks to you even like as a person that you are on a path of being a parent intentionally mm. as opposed to biologically only oh. oh yeah yeah no totally I, I totally agree um so you you know you focused on your kids for something like around five years i think before you i was stay-at-home mom right i still focus on my kids yeah, but of, co <laughs> of course of course of course but i, I was stay-at-home mom for five years yes i was um, in that time why i became a stay-at-home mom for five years because i kept having children <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> so um when my youngest went to preschool is when i got my what i would call my first step back into the career world right and i was an executive assistant for a cfo of manhattan motor cars porsche of huntington nice. porsche of princeton uh classic audi so. yeah you know i could imagine you know a car like porsche you know resin i mean i'm not the biggest car aficionado but i could imagine like you know a car like porsche can you know demand a lot of machismo and you know like you know, male energy, you know, <laughs> especially in the position that you got into. Did you experience any of that? Um, well, the CFO was actually a, a woman. Oh, okay. And she was an, um, she is, I don't know what's with the past tense with me today. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> um, Melissa is an amazing yeah. woman, very yeah. strong as well. She had something in, in common with Joan Gavidon as well, like just yeah. fiercely independent, hardworking, whip smart, and in a male dominated field. Yeah. 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 What was that experience like working with her? It was, it was eye opening 
because she had twin girls and so she was a mom as well. She is a mom as well. <laughs> She's married um, and she built a life and it, it was like a light at the end of the tunnel. Like, oh, oh, okay. I don't just have to be a mom. Right. I can too also have some kind of a career yeah. and something for myself. Yeah. So that that's, was that was the glimmer of light I that's, saw. That's totally inspiring. So, oh, that's that's amazing. So at that time, you know, when you uh, uh, worked in that position, you know, especially with that, you know, I, I love talking to people who, despite the norm of, let's say in this case, was like a male dominated industry. Mm -hmm. You know, I love to talk to people that are the kind of disruptors in a way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're, they're kind of like, you know, in this position surrounded by this norm and it just kind of shakes it up. Did you experience any kind of like, you know, uh, grunting, you know, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Locker room talk or that, yeah, that, that, you're, that you're like, you know, don't bother me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Any hardships during that time? That, I, you know? I wouldn't call them hardships. Okay. I would just call them life. I, I think okay. that I grew up with three brothers. I'm three brothers, three sisters. I know the different genders have different ways of speaking, yeah, right. behaving. Um, also, my dad would quite frequently talk about, he was a supervisor at a plant up in Brewster, Connecticut, um, a printing company, and he worked the night shift. And he would always say, this is not a place for my girls, because I always wanted to visit him at work. And he's like, absolutely not, right. because of the way the men would conduct themselves sure. and speak. And I worked at a barber shop in high school, um, all men right. in Miami when I went to school there for one year. And I mean, yes, I, I was not, I'm not easily offended. Um, I know how, when to be a fly on the wall. <laughs> right. And also, I also feel like unless it's intended to offend me, then we don't have a problem. Mm. Mm. I, you know, it's, it's, important to note this because it's like there's a lot of people that are you know sensitive you know and for you it's like because of your diverse experiences your diverse upbringing it's like you have you're cognizant yeah. about you know yourself other people how other people are and you don't let that affect you super super vital skill you know especially uh, you know what you do now but uh, talk to us about the transition when you went from you know that amazing position um, did you jo get, go into real estate afterwards or did you? So I took a break. Oh, okay. um, I actually, my husband and I both agreed that I wasn't living up to my potential. Mm. Um, I wasn't happy. I, I loved my boss because she was amazing and everything, but the work was extremely mundane after a while. Mm. Not my calling, HR, payroll, every, you know, everybody has their, what, what feeds them. Um, I didn't feel productive enough. Mm. I also felt like not, um, like I wasn't living a life of any expression. There was no artistic expression in my life. And I do have that artistic undertone to me. Yeah. Um, so it, I did try and pitch an idea of being, being somewhat of like an HR, like motivator and party planner, um, for the dealerships, but that was not a full-time position that could have been accommodated. So we parted ways amicably, um, still went to Christmas at her house, still yeah. speak to her uh, of, and, and think of her very fondly. Yeah. Um, but it took that year off to kind of work on me and nothing was coming to mind. I, I, I tried mentally thinking of different things to be, but nothing was really reaching out and grabbing me. And in our quest to find a home, we already bought an investment property, but because it was a nepotistic, uh, I made that word up by the way, guys, um, <laughs> it was, I, we bought the house from my dad. So, um, because that was an in-house purchase, there was none of the, the searching involved and the uh, researching of areas and none, none of what real estate actually encapsulates was actually involved besides this is the price. This is the address, here's the deed, <laughs> and then changing of hands. So now that we were going to be looking for our next home a year after we had purchased our investment property, I was super excited. I was so excited because as a mom, I, for years at this point, my son was nine by this time that we were looking for our house. Um, from the day he was born, I wanted to nest. I wanted, I wanted the house to just be a home. And we lived in a basement apartment. Yeah. And I made that, 
basement apartment. I can show you pictures. It's so cute. <laughs> it was a yeah. cute basement apartment, but obviously you outgrow a space. Yeah. And we had far outgrown the space in the seven years we lived there. Um, and then we moved upstairs to the to the third floor apartment and it was one additional room. You're not utilizing the entire home in a multifamily because it's a shared space. Whether it's the porch is a shared space, the stairwells, is, there, you're sharing a wall with someone, the sure. ceiling, you're, yeah, right. you're sharing your space. There's lack of privacy. Sure. And um, we definitely made that house into a home um, like any space should be, whether it's your apartment or your house or cabin, log cabin, I don't care. It, you're, you're there, you should make it a home. Right. Um, so we definitely did that twice over, but now this was our opportunity to like really spread our wings and I was super excited. Right. And in looking for a home, I really did not want to leave Nourishell mm -hmm. because, and that's where we uh, originally had our kids. Um, that's where our life seemed to have now nested, you know, yeah. and rooted because you don't just buy a house, you buy a house in a neighborhood. Mm -hmm. The neighborhood is in a community. The community is within a municipality. So you are buying into an area. Yeah. And because I knew the area, I was comfortable. My son was in Taekwondo. We have our hairdresser, we have our barber, we have our dry cleaners, we have our favorite dinner spots and dancing after hours places and the kids' schools and their friends. and. It just made sense that our life would always remain there. Yeah. But I never picked Nourishell. We, we, we happenstanced in there because of being newlyweds, thinking we were doing a stopover in a basement apartment while we just got married and got our footing and obviously had child after child. <laughs> so um, my husband opened my eyes, I thank him for that, in to let's look into different areas because he had been in the car industry for years. Right. He worked in Mount Kisco. He worked in Greenwich. He's like, yeah, I know you drive through these places, but let's go check them out. Like, right. let's go really check them out. And I was like, okay, very begrudgingly. And so we found a realtor. I will not say where because I do not endorse that site. <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> you know where. Yeah. Um, but and nice guy, very yeah. nice guy, yep. young guy, new to the industry himself, but just super honest and kind and accommodating because he had two people, one wanting not to leave this place. Like I was like, my feet are planted. And my husband who was like, let's go all over the place. <laughs> so he had a, a daunting task to take us you know, all over the place. I mean, we were in Nyack, right, we were right, in right, Mayapak, right. we were all over. To find this new nest. Yes. That you wanted to, to find. And I knew my, my gut would t tell me if a new place was okay. Right. So that's why I was open to looking, but everywhere we looked, and it's not that there was no other place that I would have found a home, but price point comes into play. Sure. So uh, we noticed that the areas that I tended to like were out of our price point right. by far. Um, so I'd what be like- What made sense to your gut? Yes. It was out of I was like, okay. love it. He's like, pocket, <laughs> remember the wallet. So um, basically in having a decent pre-approval, a, de a decent financing that we could purchase, but my husband being the only one working at the time, he really dictated what we could afford monthly as well and what financially our family would be able to sustain and not be house poor. Sure. Um, so he's a very uh, mathematical human being. And so I just deferred that all to him. Mm -hmm. And I was back on if it speaks to my gut. And we came to a place called South Salem, which is in Upper Westchester right on the border of where we are right now, New Canaan, Connecticut, and Ridgefield, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And initially driving up, we drove up for a particular house that I, I was like, oh, I'm interested to see that particular house. And I liked how different it looked mm -hmm. because South Salem does have some really unique homes. There's quite a bit of artists, right. writers, actors sure. who reside in in and about the, the, the woods up here. <laughs> Could you elaborate a little bit on what you mean by I think that, they're hiding. Why, why, so, why, no, why like, <laughs> <laughs> but but why was different? Um, the house? Yeah, because oh, you yeah, mentioned it was definitely. different. Like why why did you feel it was different? The front door was like these two doors put together. Right. But a one wow. solid door. Holy moly. So that alone, the entryway grand. It it wow. just felt unique. Um in the picture, you could see it had a double-sided fireplace, uh, uh. these soaring ceilings. 
it had a porch that wrapped around. I don't live there, by the way, guys. I don't yeah, live at this, right, right, this right, house. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but it did have a porch that wrapped around three sides of the property and just like acres upon acres. Wow. And so we both agreed, wow, this is interesting. We really, we haven't seen anything like this in our price point. And let's, let's, let's try. They were having an open house. We drove up with our realtor. And when we went to this open house, I mean, it was packed. We were actually the first people there. They wouldn't let us in until the open house started. And I understand why now. Um, <laughs> I'm on the other side. Yeah. But yes, um, when I entered the property, I was like, oh my gosh, I love it. It was essentially a side split. There were like three little steps down, but there was like a foyer grand little entryway sure. here. And then this like bonus room here and then another couple steps up here. But each part of the house felt just so unique. Right. The kitchen had a Scandinavian feel to it. The, the, the bathroom and the master felt like you were in a spa. Like there was a skylight over a egg shaped tub right. and it was like a pebble. It was sitting on pebbles double floating wow. sinks it was a very impressive but it, i know it maybe sounds a little more opulent than i'm even making it sound it wasn't the grandiose part of it it was okay. more the it felt like you you had a feeling when you walked in the bathroom you felt peace mm. you felt warmth you i didn't even want to leave the bathroom i was like <laughs> i really like it here um i think that was my favorite room in the house for sure downstairs really cool another fireplace wet bar sauna two rooms right ensuite in another room downstairs and i'm like this is the house and my husband goes we have kids <laughs> right he was like we don't need a wet bar <laughs> and the kids are on a different floor than sure, us sure. and i'm like they'll be fine <laughs> it's only a couple steps but yeah so we saw some other houses because now we were getting into the area and my rule was always and obviously covid has changed quite a few rules but at the time you could visit schools mm -hmm. he actually fell in love with this house in mayapak and i was not sold on the area. It was the most beautiful house on the block. Right. So mm -hmm. that's to go to tell you what right. the rest of the block but, but was. You weren't, but you weren't sold on that one, no. Because it's, it is the only beautiful house on the block. Uh, <laughs> the block did not match the house right. at all. It had an in-ground pool, in soaring ceilings, great room, very modern kitchen, not my style of kitchen, uh, modern for the 90s, my apologies. But, but, but again, cons in consideration of the nest theme yeah. that you're not just looking for the house right and even within the house right. it sounds like because you're you're looking at the feeling that yes. you're getting and i can totally see you know you know what you do how it translates to what you're doing now yes. like when you're you understand that it's not simply the house there's yeah. so much more to yeah. it right because someone could say well this meets your criteria you ask for an ensuite it's four bedrooms it's you know mm. kitchen dining room this that and the other Yes, but I don't feel at home here. Right. And I think that's important for people to realize, to slightly divert. Right. When you are looking for a home, why are you looking for this home? Right. Is it an investment property? Is it a long-term home? Is it to satisfy a relocation, right. satisfy multi-generational needs? In this particular stage of my life, this was my most selfish purchase that I could have made right. intentionally. That was the point of the purchase. It's supposed to feel like home. It's supposed to speak to my spirit. It's supposed to satisfy what I know the boxes need, are needed for my children. Right, right. So for example, that Mayapak house, my youngest daughter, we call her the juggernaut because when she was little, she could run through a wall and be like, sorry to the wall. Like she doesn't get hurt. Yeah. She's an amazing soccer player, amazing athlete. She jumps hurdles, her legs are bleeding, and she, she's not, she doesn't even bat an eye. She's missing toenails, she doesn't even care because she's just so motivated and she's so uh, perseverant and like just an amazingly strong yeah. person. And when she was two, three, four, five, and six, that was scary right. because she's not mentally cognizant of how much pain she's inflicting on herself and how much damage. Right. I mean, she's had a broken elbow. She's, oh, she's I mean, yeah. yeah, you have a daughter. Right. Imagine. Of course, of course, of course. It's painful. It's like heart wrenching. I'm like, I'm in pain. I don't know why you're laughing. I'm in pain. Um, so th the stairs on that particular house, I'm like, she's going to walk them like a balance beam, the type of stairs. No one else could answer that besides me. Right. So my husband's there trying to erect plexiglass, like talking about erecting a glass. <laughs> and I'm like, this is not the house for us. Right, right. 
it checks off the criteria, but it's not the house for us. Right. And so that is what I am extremely respectful of when clients come to me to wow. find a property. That's important. It does it satisfy your needs? And your needs may not even be a, a heart purchase. I call them heart or head purchases. So your heart purchase is when you speak to your gut. You always should speak to your gut, but your your heart purchase is when you, it doesn't have to make sense to me. It doesn't even have to make sense to you. It just, you don't like it. Right, right. Something about it. But a head purchase, hey, we can sit down and we can make it make sense with return on investment and the numbers right. and where you are financially now and does it satisfy your needs. That's a head purchase. Right. But, but all at the same time, it's just kind of finding the balance in a way, mm -hmm. right? Because isn't that, wouldn't that be like the, the, the home run at this point? If you can find a head purchase and a heart purchase, would you say that's like a... Unicorn? It's always, there always has to be a bit of head involved right. in the heart because right. or else I would have ended up in an area that right. I couldn't afford. That's right. So yes, right. that is the first step is just the, the practical, like common sure. sense. Sure, like sure, sure. It, you don't want to overextend yourself, but within your price point, within these parameters, does it speak to you? Right. Yes. Right. That's important. Yeah. So you ended up settling, nesting in... Uh, South Taylor. Right, right. It, was it that house that... It wasn't that house. That The house that you you said that was amazing, but then just didn't fit the community. Yeah, it even, it even had a big red barn. Yeah. And we were like, we're going to put a pool and make the barn a pool <laughs> house. Like, the plans oh we were oh, having. Oh, boy. And then he... Yeah. You know, we saw other... We started to really like the area. Yeah. And we found another house um, that, yes, we live at right now. Yeah. Uh, dead end off of a dead end. Sure. Our children, the way the ages that they were at the time that we moved up, they were about to be a 10-year-old, an 8-year-old, and a 7-year-old. That would have been great. You, you get to ride your bike. You get, yeah. that, that, that was my thought process right. there. You, you do. You get to ride your bike. You, you, there's no street lights in South Salem. So there's a level of safety without the sidewalks and without the street lights that you can still speak to that 1980s kind of kid sure. childhood that I uh, that I had where you're outside. That That's the point. Be outside in your yard. Be outside with friends. Be yep. outside with your siblings. And um, that neighborhood afforded that. Yeah. So house definitely checked up all the boxes. All the kids' bedrooms are on the same floor as ours, <laughs> as my husband would wanted. But it's a traditional center colonial. Oh, wow. So it is... Not speaking to my artistic side, however, you make a house your home. So definitely um, when you walk into our billiard room or a theater room or a rec room or, you know, our den even, you do feel that there's a lot of personality yeah. in the house. So it's fine. Yeah. So so once you moved in, I mean, would you say that, oh, man, I got bit by the bug. Like, you know, I want to get into this industry. No, it was yeah. while we were actually still looking in New York. Oh, okay. Um, I'm sorry. We, we're still in New York, but lower yeah. lower Westchester, I should sure. say. Um, we would walk into different homes, and my realtor would be impressed with all the terms that I knew right. of the architecture yeah. of the homes. The wainscoting, the crown molding, dental crown molding, the yeah. type of flooring, herringbone, uh, the per pergolas outside, and things like that. By, by the way, I just wanted to say, <laughs> like, just wanted to say for our viewers, like, you know, this is like a culmination of everything that we talked about. You yeah. Know? You're a self-starter, you're focused, yeah, you're passionate about things that is important to you. And at that time, what's important to you is, you know, understanding the industry, right? Yeah. Nobody, it, it doesn't seem to me like you're somebody who's going to get the wool, you know, put over your eye. Right. Especially, especially in the things that is important to you. Right. right. I'm definitely paying attention. Yeah. And in looking for a property, he was impressed with my knowledge of the types of properties and he actually was encouraging of me to get my license he was like you would be great at this right, right. and i was like oh shut up <laughs> <laughs> let's go back to looking for a house for me shall yeah, we yeah, yeah. and we're looking we're looking we're looking and then my husband started to kind of pay attention and he was like you think she could really do this and the two of them are talking like I'm not there um, <laughs> because I'm a, I'm a mere housewife at the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but no. <laughs> and um, you really think she can do this? How much you think, you know, da, da, da. and I could see my husband trying to wrap his head around. Can she still be a stay at home mom and do this? Because there was this awesomeness to never having to worry about who has our kids. Right. Like they're always yeah. with me. Right. <laughs> so, um, and I don't mind that at all. And so therefore, when I, I did 
go to school with both of their encouragement. Um, but obviously, it's me who had to take the classes. It's me sure. who had to pass the state boards. And it's um, in doing so, I found myself like, OK, I have this exam final, great. And I have the state boards completed. And now what do I do? How do, how do I get business? I, I didn't know how to run the business, right. how to be a realtor. Like, yes, if a client comes to me, I can take great care of them. But how do I get a client to come to me? Right. Like, you can't go up to someone and make them buy a, buy a house. You know, this is a, this is a different type of a purchase. Right. It's not, and I'm not minimizing any other type of sales. But this is, a t this is the biggest purchase you will ever make. Mm. Even if it's the smallest house or the smallest co-op or the smallest condo and it's your first purchase or, or, or your only purchase, it's still the biggest thing you'll ever own yeah. for you. So that's a huge undertaking and understanding how to get clients and how to nurture those clients nice. and, and get them to the finish line appropriately with the right vendors and the right support. And um, that, that's all been a, a life lesson that I, I've continued to learn yeah. and, and love doing. Yeah, and, and I love the, again, you know, this is not happenstance for you. Like right. what, what anything that, any great undertaking that you do, you know, you, you take it seriously, you take it focused. And, you know, even, you know, your current endeavor now, right? Um, Nest with Nas, right? Or, did I, did Nas Nest. Right? I'm sorry, Nas, Nas Nest, yeah, right? Yeah, Nest with Nas is how you find us on our Instagram handle. Yes. But, but Nas Nest is my real estate team. Yes, because it's like, again, a culmination of, again, you know, your passion and your belief on the community, your care about community, you know, um, your focus, your determination, you know, you know, again, embodying kind of your life in a way. Yeah. And, and I'm always so happy to encounter and speak with people that had a dream put, you know, you know, put their passion into their dream. You know, in your case, like, you know, you wanted to be an attorney and, yeah. you know, yeah, you pursued it and you got it. You got to that level. You know, you wanted to be a, a full time stay at home mom. You have pursued it. You got to that level. You were a great mom and you are a great mom, you know. You. And now even with, you know, real estate, you know, this is like the next big I, journey for you, right? I, I feel like, well, for law, I didn't see it to fruition for sure because I didn't actually go to law school I didn't oh, oh, okay. I, I was a paralegal oh, okay, okay, so okay. sorry I don't no no yeah, no yeah, yeah. I just don't want to mislead anyone, oh no no, no okay, you know? okay, sorry, but yeah. um in in real estate I feel like this is is allowing me to marry all of the right. things that make yes. me me I I do offer guidance to my clients but I'm not legal counsel oh of course however of course. I understand the legal process the legal right. process yeah. but I totally respect all the vendors. I do not do the lender's job for them, no. the attorney's job for them, the inspector's job for them, but it does help that growing up with a dad such as mine, I understand what grout lines are and, <laughs> and, and foundation yeah. and septic and sewer, you know, sewer, municipal and, and city, all of these things, like you said, it's, it's my full life put together plus my education. Yes. So not just undergrad education, but also my continuing education as a real estate agent, yeah. which we have to do, well, for Connecticut annually and for New York biannually. Sure, sure. So, and then marrying your life philosophy. Of, yeah. You know, it's not just about a house. It's about the community, the people. Yeah. How are you contributing? Well, right? Nas Nest means not just one sale and the nest nesting nesting is in your community in your home making your house a home um, and nest is a home <laughs> that's what it is so 100%. yeah that's 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 what it all stands for that's the yeah. end goal and the end goal is that it's never over it's not over so not just one sale means your life doesn't have to be only what you thought it was mm. it can be so much more yeah and it's not knocking. You're not supposed to look at the Joneses and, and follow what your neighbors are doing or your friends from college are doing. It's, are you living too small? Are you mm. thinking too small? Because every tier that you get to is, should be celebrated. It should be appreciated. It should be acknowledged. Yeah. Um, I don't knock at those years I was in the basement. I look back on those, those years fondly. At the time, did I feel stuck? Definitely. Yeah. So you, I think it's important to honor a moment in your life for the moment that it is. Yeah. But understand that it's a moment. 
you don't have to stay there. Yeah. Our kids are never going to be the ages they are ever again. Right. That's true. So the stage you're going through with your daughter right now with sleeping. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Do we think that's going to be an issue at 15? I hope no, not. No, I hope not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. But, but that's my point. Right, right. So you honor this stage, yeah. and it comes with its own set of headaches and annoyances and beauty. Like you said, she's going to see, like, Disney characters and be so excited, right? At 15, maybe not. Probably not. Right. 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 So right. the good and the bad are in this moment. And in future moments, there's a different good and yeah. a different bad. Man, I love it. This is very deep. And I think, you know, <laughs> it's something definitely to, to marinate on. But, you know, looking back at, you know, all the experiences that you've had, if you had a time machine, go back in time. Uh, I'll say, you know, I mean, whether it's right out of college or, you know, or whatever time you choose, is there anything that you change or any advice that you would give yourself? Um, or, or you don't have to if you... If no, you I'm, you, yeah. I'm thinking. I'm genuinely yeah. thinking yeah, sure. because I've always prided myself on being a person who doesn't cry over spilled milk. Sure. So I just... It's a lesson to be learned. But, I mean, who wouldn't want a time machine? So let me think. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I would go back to when I first started in real estate. Mm. And I would implement things that I'm implementing now and three years ago when I started my team. Just being more authentically myself and not what I think someone else wants me mm. to be and how they want me to present. Right. Because obviously I'm a little funky. <laughs> <laughs> you are not funky, you're stylish. <laughs> oh, thank you. I've had purple hair, so. <laughs> no, but I feel like, you know, I, I, I'm not completely artistic, but I, I do love art. And I'm not completely preppy, but I am also preppy. And, and I feel like being a multifaceted person, you're not being inauthentic. I'm just multifaceted. Yeah. So living in that truth that it's okay for me to be me at all mm. times in every room that I'm in, that's the advice I'd ah, give myself. That's great, you know? And I wanna say consistently, consistently, the people that I have on the podcast, you know, um, the people that are at the peak of their game, you know, and even people that, you know, we uh, read biographies about, you know, Mark Cubans, you know, Charles Bronson, you know, uh, 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 et cetera, et cetera, they have this sense of, you know, being real mm -hmm. with themselves yeah. and just, you know, and encouraging, yeah. you know, uh, others and, you know, continuing to remind themselves to just, you know, stay that path. Yeah. Like Authenticity is attractive. Right. If you don't believe you, then that is going to read through to someone else. Right. They're going to smell the BS on you. 100%. They're going to feel the poser. They're going to, there's something that's going to resonate. We're animals at our core, right? I mean, we just can talk and use our cell phones, sure. but we're animals. And so we have, we have a scent that we have a gut instinct. You know, we have a fight or flight. We have all of these things that are animalistic about us. And one of those things is people find their tribe and, you know, I may not be for everyone and that's okay. Right. And I actually welcome that I'm not for everyone. I love that. <laughs> I love that because, you know, within that process, you know, there's just, it's so attractive to say, hey, I'm going to change an opinion about something. Yeah. Just so I can fit in and be yeah. liked. Yeah. But you know what? It's okay to not be liked. And there's yeah. like billions of people in this world. Yeah. Billions. You know, like, <laughs> like, you don't have to have all billions of people yeah. like you, you yeah. know? Um, now, I got to ask you, would you say that, you know, where you are now, was it due to hard work or luck? You know, what would you attribute your success? I, if I could change the word luck to blessing, okay. then yeah. I would say hard work and blessings. Mm. It, it's definitely hand in hand. One mm. didn't go without the other. Interesting. They're together um, because I've been blessed in so many ways. Right. But without me working hard, I would not have a, been able to attain anything. Mm. So if I didn't have those blessings, I'd probably not be in the position I'm in, right. but I'm on a different path right now because of my blessings and my hard work. But Sasha, again, thank you so much for coming on Secret Sauce with Ham Salau. Oh, thank providing, you for having you know, me. Providing the light that you did provide. I mean, I love, I love this, like documenting, you know, different, you know, histories and past stories because it's a part of our humanity, yeah. you know, and it's like, uh, especially you know, ones with such a diverse background as you. So uh, I'll definitely link 
uh, Sasha's information in the description, uh, Instagram, you know, all her uh, website, her pages. You know, if you need a kick butt real estate agent that knows what they're doing, that considers the community, considers the heart, you know, Sasha is the one to reach out. Sasha, thank you so much. Thank it was you. an honor. Thank you. <laughs>